we have to keep in mind not only the places you mentioned, but mm. Southeast Asia, for the yes. most part, is not democratic, yet yeah. it is essentially pro-Western, pro-American, mm. anti-Chinese. There's mm. change now afoot in Thailand, of course, but generally Southeast Asia has pockets of it that are not democratic. And uh, so the world does not neatly divide. You know, I was a foreign correspondent for decades. And what I saw was not a black and white situation mm. of great mm. democracies and terrible dictatorships. Mm. I saw a lot of gray shades, mm. a lot of dictatorships where people had civil rights, where people had predictable, decent lives. And I also saw some shambolic, you know, totally unstable democracies. Mm. Um, and I think that one mistake that the Biden administration has made in Ukraine, though generally I think their policy has mm. been pretty good, we could mm. talk about that maybe, but one mistake they've made is to you know, make it a contest of democracy versus mm. authoritarianism, mm. Mm. because um, uh, it should be something even bigger. It should just be hold, uh, upholding some sort of rules-based order where a big country cannot just physically attack another, you know, reasonably sized country, you know, with, with massive weapons and human rights violations, and everyone would just get, you know, accepted. You know, remember when James Baker um, you know, came up with like a 34 nation coalition to oppose uh, Iraq's occupation of Kuwait. Most of those countries were not democracies and mm. Baker didn't care. Mm. Um, because Baker was more interested in reconciliations mm. rather than giving ultimatums. Mm. I mean, one can see that a, a kind of um, a monotonic uh, insistence on this as democracy versus autocracy is going to alienate a lot of a lot of powers in in the in the first place, and it, it looks like a way of the U.S. or the West or Europe re trying to reclaim a sort of global primacy that it's already lost. I mean, well, already. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is um, uh, a multipolar world isn't a dark Putinist plot. We're already in one. It's just a fact. Yeah. It's what we it's what we do with it. Uh, it's what the, the how the West um, adapts to it, which is uh, which is key. And so insisting on this democratic democracy versus authoritarian, it it, it, it it blinds one to the real power power relations. I mean, I think by the way, I thought that the reemergence of um, Assad in the Middle East recently as a sort of credible, almost respectable figure was a warning in some sense, which is that um, the, the notion that one can attempt to intervene, as the West did in a very complicated uh, internal struggle of the kind that went on in Syria, fail and leave, it, doesn't, it, it, it does have long-term consequences. The long-term consequences were that Russia entered the vacuum and kept its client in power, and he's still there. Can you envisage yeah. a situation in which, let's think of a kind of a dark scenario. Could there be a situation five years from now in which Putin was in that, in a similar position? It's not impossible, yeah. is it? Yeah, I think, you know, that gets us into, into two subjects, the difference between the Middle East and Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, Europe... <clears throat> You know, because Europe has all the building blocks of democracy, it's got middle classes, it's got, you know, a long tradition of parliamentarianism. Mm -hmm. The few countries in Europe that are not democracies like Belarus mm -hmm. and Russia are, you know, are devastating failures. Mm -hmm. um, so I think over the next few months, we're about to see a fork in the road in Europe. Hmm. whereby if the Ukrainians really do well on the battlefield over the next few weeks and months, hmm. um, we're going to see, a, you, know, a, you know, a lot of triumphalism about the success hmm. of democracy. And that will be true for Europe. Hmm. Um, but, it, but it does not carry over into the Middle East or hmm. other parts of the hmm. world, as hmm. we saw at the end of the Cold War, hmm. when because Poland became free, people hmm. started to say, therefore, Liberia and Sierra Leone will be yeah. free, yeah. you know, and there was no connection. So there were a lot of dashed hopes in the 1990s mm. because people thought 
you know, we had reached the end of history in 1989. Mm -hmm. I think something similar might evolve now because I do think the Ukrainians are going to do very, very well on the battlefield in the next few months. Mm -hmm. I, a different analogy I would make is I remember having conversations with people in uh, uh, the run-up to and then the immediate aftermath of the Iraq war in which some of them, mostly from the United States, said, look, well, we were able to uh, have democratic regimes in former Nazi Germany and former militarist Japan. So we can in Iraq. And what I said at that time was, however terrible, and indeed it was uniquely terrible, Nazi Germany was, there was still a civil society underneath there. They'd been in power for 13 years, not 30 years. They'd done colossal and unique and irreparable harms, but there, was st there were still institutions that could be removed. And that was also true, actually, of Japan, the first non-Western country to industrialize. Uh, that there, were, there were a couple of generations there. So the idea that what might work in uh, if 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 the Ukrainians do do as well as uh, um, you suggest they will in the next few months, this kind of triumphalism, even if the triumphalism reverberates successfully in Europe, you're quite right. It will not reverberate successfully in the Middle East or in Africa or in many other parts of the world. Yes, because, um, you know, just look at Sudan now. Mm -hmm. We had at least a first round disappointment mm. in elections in Turkey mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, it's a matter of, you know, Germany, Japan, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the end of World War II were completely defeated, yes. devastated societies. And occupied. And occupied. And, uh, occupied, and yes. nevertheless had the building blocks yes. of middle class existence. Yes. yes. Um, and they didn't have great ethnic splits or anything mm. like that. Mm. So they were perfect. And also the American public was willing to underwrite mm a mm. vast democracy building project mm. in those mm. countries mm. because they had just fought a war over it, mm. essentially, a, you know, a mass conscription war. Yeah. But yeah. those things don't, they just do not obtain. And a further thing that doesn't obtain, which world. is that even though Russia is weak in many ways, it's expanding in parts of Africa. Yes. I yes. mean, or at, least, or at least proxies of it or expressions of it, the Wagner Group, are expanding into Mali where the French were. Yes. So actually, in some parts of the world, it's still an expanding presence. Yes. I'd like to bring up something, John, that you you had uh, written in The New Statesman, I think, that this, you know, this um, the, indicting Putin as a war criminal mm. uh, in The Hague is a very interesting event because, as you put it, it sort of presupposes that there will be a post-Putin Russia and it mm. will be benign. Mm. Um, but that's a lot to assume. It is. I mean, you know, obviously there will someday be a post-Putin Russia, you know, maybe sooner rather than later. We don't know. But the idea that Russia will somehow be more benign after mm. Putin or mm. easier to deal with. Well, mm. that's a possibility, a strong possibility, but it may not be a probability. No. No, I don't think it is. I mean, it's, we're in a realm which is so uncertain that probabilities even don't apply. It's real uncertainty. But I see no reason to suppose that Russia might not either uh, um, shrink into a radical nationalist Russia led by someone perhaps even less rational and even more dangerous than Putin has proved to be, or break up altogether. Uh, like it did in uh, when the Tsarist Empire collapsed uh, as a result partly of the First World War. When at one point, I think there were 13 separate state-like entities in Russia and somewhere around 10 or 12 million people died in the following, in the wars, plague, famines, and so on and so forth. So the assumption that um, uh, he can be tried with a kind of a benign Russia in the background uh, which approves of this trial and doesn't see it as yet another humiliation or another defeat is a big assumption. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one thing we should keep our eye on is I said earlier that I think the Ukrainians are going to do very well on the battlefield over the next few weeks and months. Um, if they're able to seriously, fundamentally threaten Crimea, mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I think Putin could be in a lot of trouble because Crimea is not Eastern Ukraine. Mm. Crimea, you know, has associations with Catherine the Great. Mm. It goes back to Russian historical mm. romanticism. Mm. Mm. Um, if Putin is seen to be the cause of potentially losing Crimea, mm. that could cause a real, um, you know, a real power struggle of some I mean, even, sort. Even you know, Gorbachev. To my knowledge, even Gorbachev, and until recently, even Navalny, did not argue for giving back Crimea to Ukraine. They see that as Solzhenitsyn, as huge numbers of Russian intellectuals and thinkers have seen it, as actually a, uh, a foundational part in geopolitical terms, the port and so on, but as part of, uh, as part of Russia. I think if really... Crimea looks seriously in question, then the balloon goes up. That's the risk. Not only is put, Putin at risk, if Putin's at risk, then will he take it lying down? Or, or will he throw the dice again? We don't know, do we? No, no, we don't know. I think one thing we should say, um, you know, because the title of this program is The Age of Tragedy or some yes. sort, um, is what we mean by tragedy. Yes. And by tragedy doesn't mean that we're pessimists. Mm. Um, it means that, you know, because, uh, because disappointment and failure is the normal rule of life in any mm. case. That's not what the Greeks meant by tragedy. Mm. Mm -hmm. What the Greeks really meant was a world of tough choices yeah. where, you know, where the world is inherently imperfect, yet yeah. at the same time, it is beautiful. Mm. Um, and tragedy means, you know, making decisions between two goods. You can only choose one good over another good, but whatever you choose will cause suffering in mm -hmm. some quarter. Mm. Um, and therefore, an age of tragedy just means, uh, you know, an age where things will not be perfect, where we can't always get what we want all the time, mm. that, you know, that we'll have to choose between... Um, giving in to authoritarianism and, mm. or, you know, and, and demanding perfect democratic outcomes because we shouldn't mm. give in to authoritarianism, but at the same time, we're not going to be able to demand in every case perfect democratic outcomes. I, I agree with that wholly, and I think that's something that we could uh, uh, talk a little more about. I'd put it perhaps very similarly to the way you put it, Robert, but maybe... Um, slightly even more strongly, I would say uh, when we talk of tragedy in geopolitics or elsewhere, we're not just talking about imperfectibility. We're not just talking about the intermittent or reversible character of progress. We're not just talking about why hi that history hasn't ended. If we go back to the Greeks and, uh, and, and later to, to Shakespeare and other writers of tragic drama, what we're talking about is that... Um, there are recurrent situations in the human world in which whatever is chosen involves irreparable loss. Yeah. And may, uh, the, those choices may be noble. They may be uh, heroic, sometimes often are. Uh, uh, they, may, they may activate the most um, valuable and admirable features of human beings, of human agency but they involve irreparable loss. So the idea that we would eventually get to some point in world politics or human society in which there was no tragedy would mean that these conflicting values would somehow all be harmonized. But that's not the way the human world is, and it's certainly not the way geopolitics is. So, uh, but I think that's entirely consistent with, with what you've said, because what it means is um, we can't say, we won't support that because it doesn't involve a perfectly democratic outcome. We won't support that because it involves legitimating some kind of injustice. And that's why I think I'm rather maybe slightly more skeptical than you are of a legalistic model of international relations. Because if we say, well, this regime or this leader has committed crimes, can't ever do a deal with him. He's got to go to, the, to a court. I think that actually makes um, conflict potentially more devastating than it could otherwise be. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. And in fact, you know, indicting heads of state 
Mm. Uh, you know, as war criminals has problems because mm. it means you cannot make a deal with them. Yes. yes. And, and often in order to end a conflict in a mm. country, yeah. you have to, um, you, you know, you have to give the losing side some assurance that it mm. won't be prosecuted. That if they're going to, if they're going to lose, every, if they're going to lose everything. Yeah. Yeah. That why, they can why, just why, go why, away why? quietly. Yeah, yeah, but if they're going to lose everything, not only their power and their privileges, but but their reputation and their their freedom and everything, what what incentive do they have to do any deal? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it was uh, Edith Hamilton, the mm. great American uh, um, classicist of the early mid twentieth century, who wrote that not to think tragically is to rob life of its significance. Mm -hmm. Um, so tragic thinking is inherent in any serious mm. statesmanship. Mm. And we saw that, you know, put to good use in some of three of my favorite statesmen, uh, you know, in mm. the second half mm. of the 20th century, um, George Schultz, James mm. Baker and Henry Kissinger, mm. who mm. all, you know, had a very, you know, tragic world view, but all did, uh, you know, all did a lot of good. Schultz did, you know, you know, Schultz stood up for human rights in Africa at the same time he was enabling the Helsinki mm. process in um, in uh, in Central Eastern Europe. Um, you know, Baker was integral to the success of the first Gulf War and Kissinger, of course, by moving over to China mm. in order to balance against Russia mm. and then nevertheless having detente with Russia, mm. uh, you know, you know, indicates that it's not so much a pessimistic worldview. No. It's just a worldview that realizes that things are not going to be perfect. And sometimes you have to select the lesser evil. Mm. Yeah, and that conflict between goods and lesser evils or goods and goods is permanent. I guess that's what, I mean, that, that's, I mean, not that any particular conflict is permanent, uh, but that that situation we're in is, a, is, a, is a, a permanent situation. It would exist, Robert, I think, even if there was, I'm not sure it would be desirable, a world government, because if there was a world government somewhere, it would have to decide what to do with rebels. It would have yeah. to decide if one country in that had hitherto been independent rebelled against the world government. It would be like a gigantic Roman Empire. What would they do? They would have to suppress them or do deals with them. They'd have to do something to preserve the order. Yes. Um, well, in any case, w w we should never have a world government because a world government by, defi by definition would be very oppressive. Absolutely. There would be an assumption that everyone agrees on the basic modes of order and politics, etc., which, of course, people never will. It's not will. the case. It's not the yeah, case. Yeah, it's not the case. So world government, by definition, has to be oppressive. Yes. But what we can move towards is maybe more of a, a, a form of world governance, mm. um, you know, you know with, with major powers. Um, but we're not there yet. I mean, you know, we have an antiquated UN mm. where countries like India are not represented, but a country like France is, you know, you know on the Security Council, I mm. mean. So that, um, you know, we, we don't have the procedures in place Mm. Um, um, to, you know, you know, to make a difference as much as I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is that it's all about interest and power. I mm. mean, the United States is the biggest military power in the world. It has a self-interest in seeing Ukraine, you know, win, but not not win overwhelmingly, totally mm. so as to bring down mm. Putin and Russia, but to win, essentially, to show that you know, to show that invasions of that sort will mm. fail, you know? Mm. Um, so, and, and, you know, I, and as I said earlier, I think the Biden administration in its own non-intellectual way has been thinking, you know, been thinking, you know, tragically about it in a constructive manner. Mm. In other words, they want Ukraine to win, but they're afraid of a catastrophic victory that yes. would lead to that would lead to chaos or or something unpredictable mm. in mm. Moscow. Mm. I think one factor which will play very importantly in that, and it looks as if it might even be being considered now, is that the impact of the Ukraine war so far has been millions of refugees. 
I don't know, three to five million or something going to different countries, to Poland and elsewhere. Um, the impact of a Russian collapse could be twice that many. And that's surely, I mean, it's a part of what you were talking about earlier. I mean, if, if, if there was a catastrophic victory, a victory which crippled the Russian state, which, you know, may not be that strong anyway uh, 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 at this time. Um, uh, and there was a rerun of what happened in 1919 and um, multiple civil wars and so on and conflicts between mercenary groups. I read somewhere, by the way, that some people think that there might be up to 30 semi-private mercenary groups in Russia at the moment, not just the Wagner one, but others smaller. Imagine the lid coming off that and what, what that would mean. It would mean, among other things, uh, an aspect of interconnectedness, which uh, is great, much greater now than it was um, in the 19th century or the early 20th century. Colossal waves of migration into Europe and elsewhere. And that, surely, that prospect is one of the things that is possibly even weighing in the mind, weighing in the mind of Poland and and possibly even the United States and France and others that are wary of a catastrophic victory. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, always remember that Russia is much more weakly institutionalized than China. Mm. Uh, were Xi Jinping to get sick tomorrow or be incapacitated, yes. the Chinese have a bureaucratic mechanism that's mm. fairly transparent in order so to select a new leader. Now, that could lead to some turmoil. It could lead to radical shift in policy eventually. But there is a bureaucratic mm. mechanism in place, uh, you know, to replace the leader in, in China to a degree that does not exist in Quite. Russia. Quite. Um you know, you know, Russia, it's a black box, you know, uh, as to what, you know, as, as as to what can happen were Putin to be seriously threatened. Um, and remember, we, we are talking about a country with, you know, tremendous amounts of both strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. Yes. And I mean, I think that's a very important also a difference between the Cold War, because however hard it was to read Soviet intentions, these were large groups of old men in suits with names and histories that were widely known, meeting in rooms and coming to decisions. That's all gone because the Communist Party's gone. The Communist Party's still there in China. Uh, it's probably never been as important as it is now as a disciplinary mechanism. What is it, 95 million members, something like that? Absolutely yeah. enormous. In Russia, there's Putin, shadowy semi-criminal semi uh um privatized groups and otherwise as you say a black box so we just don't know and one of the reasons we may not know about the inner working is that the, a lot of the interstices a lot of the layers don't exist anymore there are large vacuums of, of, of voids that can be suddenly killed remember the speculation in the west as to um uh, uh who who assassinates whom People are assassinated in the uh, shadow of the Kremlin. Was it Putin? Or was it someone else? Was it the Chechens? Well, no one knows. And I think that's a, a, a situation which um, uh, um, uh, very much supports your, your analysis, which is that the levels of state capacity in Russia are, are much lower. It may be highly coercive. They may be adopting a kind of semi-Stalinoid attitude to defend, to uh, dissent. But there's nothing like the depth of state capacity that exists in, in China. Yes. And keep in mind, during the Cold War, this, you know, nobody, not Brezhnev, not Kosygin, not Andropov, nobody had as much power as Putin has now. Mm. 